All right, folks, we are now recording. Hi, everybody. Good day. Welcome to today's Cathedral webinar. Today, you are going to be learning about the new FERC petition from the Alliance for Tribal Clean Energy. My name is Brooke Warrington. I'm the Training and Development Specialist here at the Native Learning Center. We're also thrilled that you could join us for today's webinar. If you could follow along while I read the disclaimer aloud, this webinar provides a summary of fundamental concepts, requirements, and or procedures within the allotted 90 minutes. The material discussed does not illustrate all possible scenarios that could be applicable. We also have our copyright infringement law picture here. So just a friendly reminder that the webinar materials are protected by copyright, trademark, trade secret, and other intellectual property laws. Now um, we are on this new platform and it's got a little bit of different lingo from our last one. Um, so know that um, all of the information that you need is housed within the course section. And when you are ready to actually join a live webinar, you'll just log in and you will click um, the green banner at the top of your screen. Whenever we have a live webinar going on, that is how you are able to join. Now, ordinarily, we do request that you guys join with um, listening only capabilities so that we can cut down on the audio feedback. However, in today's webinar, they are going to have a Q&A at the end of their presentation. Um, so I'm going to be going through a few more intro slides. So if y'all have joined with only listening capabilities, go ahead and click out of the webinar and rejoin and rejoin with that mic capability as well. Um, and then just mute yourself when you get in and that way you are able to participate in the question and answer section. And then if you wish to change your speaker or the microphone device that you're using, you can click on that phone button or that phone icon down at the bottom of the screen. And that'll present a list of all of your mic devices as well as your sound devices. And you can click the correct speaker or microphone that you wish to use. You do have ways to interact during today's webinar. So know that I've provided uh, several links for you, both within the chat as well as the shared notes. So we have a link to today's webinar feedback survey. There is a copy of the presentation slides that you can download for yourself. There is a link to the FERC petition page. There's another Alliance webinar that explains the petition. And then there is also a link to the one pager that they have created. I actually forgot to put that in the chat. So sorry guys, I put that in the notes and I'm putting that in the chat right now. It is all the way down at the bottom. Okay, um, so when you do rejoin with your mic capability, you can just mute yourself by clicking on that microphone icon. When you wanna ask a question in the chat, perhaps, you can just type it into that box that I have circled. Whenever you have your message ready, you'll click on that uh, paper airplane icon to send it in. And then let's say you feel like you asked a question we missed along the way, feel free to use that hand raise icon to draw my attention to it. I will be monitoring the chat though. Know that any tech support problems can be submitted there and I will do my best to help you navigate through them. We do have another way you can interact on this platform. If you look at your user list and you click on your name, you have the opportunity to set a status for yourself. Um, you can signal that you have your hand raised, that you're undecided, confused, sad, happy, show applause, give a thumbs up, give a thumbs down. They're just little reactions. You can switch them up throughout the webinar and you can also clear them out altogether if you wish. I'm gonna go ahead and set mine to happy so you can see what I mean. So you see in the users list, my name now shows a smiley face. All right, folks, just a final note before I hand it off to the Alliance for Tribal Clean Energy. Um, we have learned on this platform that if you click on that red menu panel, that's all the way to the left side of your screen, it does pull you out of the virtual class that you're in right now. It'll pull you out of the webinar. It's very easy to rejoin. You'll just click on that green banner once again, and it'll bring you right back in. But I just wanna give you a heads up if you're kind of clicking around on the screen a little bit and you click on that red panel, it will take you out of what we're looking at right now. But you can just rejoin again. All right, folks, let me switch to your presentation. And I'm gonna hand it off to you now, Wendelin, and let me know when we are ready for our next speaker. Thanks so much, you guys. Wonderful, thank you so much for that, Brooke. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wendelin Holland. I serve as Senior Advisor for Policy, Tax, and Federal Government Relations at the Alliance for Tribal Clean Energy. And I just want to express uh, enormous gratitude to the Seminole Nations Native Learning Center. Um, I know you all have a fantastic audience and a really impressive uh, uh, team of folks who attend these things. So we really appreciate the platform and the partnership here. Um, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you, Brooke, and uh, I'm sure many others at your event in January. So I'll put in a plug for the Seminole Nations uh, Renewable Energy event that you guys are putting together in January. 
Um, but what we're going to talk about here, folks, is uh, a petition that the Alliance for Tribal Clean Energy has placed before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. The acronym you're going to hear over and over again today is FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And I have with me today uh, two of my esteemed colleagues, uh, Crystal Miller and Claudio Clini, uh, both part of the policy team at the Alliance for Tribal Clean Energy. Please feel free to put any questions in the public chat. Uh, as well as please feel free to reach out to us directly at the Alliance for Tribal Clean Energy if you'd like to discuss any of these particular points um, later this week or, or any other time, really. Um, we've got a little time here, um, and we're very much uh, in, a, in a virtual roadshow, if you will. Um, we're talking to tribes kind of every day, um, uh, explaining to them what this petition has been all about and, uh, and how it came about. Um, this is the agenda that we're going to be running through here today. Um, we're going to talk about the core legal basis for this petition and then get down in the weeds just a little bit with the commercial readiness deposits. Take a step back and um, take a look at um, how FERC is dealing with, um, with their consultation and uh, what we've learned in the last couple of days. We had the first consultation session <clears throat> earlier this week on, <clears throat> excuse me, on Monday. Um, and then we'll dive in uh, a little bit more on the specific queries that FERC has posed to this community. Um, and then just a little bit more about um, kind of where we all are in the process on that. Um, and uh, please, again, put any questions you might have in the chat and feel free to reach out to us. Um, we at the Alliance for Tribal Clean Energy are an indigenous-led 501c3 nonprofit. I am the only non-native member of the senior leadership team. And um, we have a, a range of technical abilities in policy, tax, um, engineering, science, uh, tribal sovereignty, and we meet tribes where they are in their, um, in their clean energy journey. Hmm. Um, so this petition came about very organically. Uh, a, a handful of tribes reached out to us in the last year and a half or so, and uh, in response to new fees that had been uh, required of them coming out of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, new fees that would be associated with the utility scale renewable energy projects that they're building. And these projects that the tribes are building uh, have price tags on the order of many tens of millions of dollars. Uh, these, are, these are big, heavy projects. Um, these aren't the individual residential scale or community scale solar projects. Uh, they're, they're larger utility scale projects, and they could be solar or wind or geothermal. But the specific item about these is that they're going to plug in. They're going to interconnect to the electrical grid. What we did not do in, in this idea for the petition, we did not take a giant look at all of the federal bureaucracy and what should be dismantled or, or impacted in order to help tribes uh, with their clean energy journeys or or uh, improve tribal sovereignty. Um, that's not how this came about. This came about because very specifically, several tribes came to us and said, because of FERC Order 2023, that was effective about a year and a half ago in July 2023, um, because of this, uh, tribes were being required to add fees, add additional costs to their capital stack, to the cost of building their project, something on the order of Five million dollars in different um, independent system operator companies, or seven and a half, uh, seven and a half million dollars in other territories. These are not insignificant costs. This wasn't an extra hundred dollars here or there. This is on the order of several million dollars. And so the tribes came to us and said, uh, "We need help. Uh, can you help us find five million dollars?" And oh yeah, by the way, we need that in the next two weeks or we need seven and a half million dollars by the end of the month. And it's my experience in clean energy finance, and I've been in the clean energy industry for about 20 years now, that the only entities that have five million or seven and a half million dollars lying around and able to access quickly are those who already have that, those sort of funds on their balance sheets. And those would be the incumbent non-native developers who are so active in these spaces. So FERC's idea of imposing these interconnection Q fees in order to reduce speculation in the market, that was the, the core fundamental argument, um, we said this, these shouldn't apply to tribes. 
and these shouldn't apply to tribes uh, because um, tribes are not speculating. In fact, they are providing uh, fundamental services for their teams. Take a quick step back here. Brooke had her disclaimers. Here's our disclaimer. Um, we know that in this process, we are not lobbying. FERC actions are not public dockets. Um, they, they are public dockets. These are rules. They're not laws. And we are uh, quite clear that um, this activity is not lobbying. Um, and we're happy to discuss that further with you. In addition, there's another element about that kind of, you know, the, the guardrails, if you will, around government relations in this aspect is that any of us, any Americans, we can all, native, non-native, any of us can call up FERC any time at all um, on this particular matter. Um, these are not subject to ex parte discussions. Uh, the Office of Public Participation at FERC is open to having these discussions with tribes, tribal members, and or, or their representatives, um, and the FERC commissioners and their staff themselves. So this is open. So we, we, we don't need to be looking at this discussion, this petition, these activities as something that's very narrow and closed. We can have wider conversations about that. And the um, uh, uh, Crystal or Claudia, if I could ask one of you please to throw in the, the public chat here, the email address that is OPP at FERC.gov, and folks can reach out to FERC on that. Um, but the, to get to the core legal argument here, folks, is, is that is that FERC Order 2023 was designed to discourage speculation in the market. That's the core legal argument. And that tribes are not speculating when they're building their utility scale renewable energy projects. So these new fees, something on the order of $5 million or $7.5 million for these initial um, interconnection queue security deposits, they may have um, defeated some of the developers from holding multiple queue spots simultaneously or holding different queue spots in different regions throughout the country, sort of trying to hedge their bets, not really sure where they were going to build their project. So they just sort of signed up in a bunch of places. And the signing up in a bunch of places was clogging the queue. FERC knew that queue clogging, having way too many people getting ready to, to plug in to interconnect their utility scale renewable energy projects, that this was causing a problem. And so they imposed these fees. Well, it turns out that... Um, uh, they, they did, in fact, defeat a little bit of that, and the the the, the queue clogging has reduced. Um, but what it did was it impeded tribes, uh, many tribes, from joining up at all. Um, we at the alliance were successful in helping two tribes obtain waivers from FERC for having to um, having to pay these initial interconnection queue fees. But after we paid the very hefty <laughs> Washington DC attorney bills to get those waivers. After we paid those fees twice, we said, hold on, we can't do this 574 times. There's gotta be a better way. And so we, as, as we say, we swam upstream and we decided to go solve the problem right at its source. And we said to FERC that you guys in, uh, in, in passing this order, um, that this was a, as we like to say in the petition, it was a solution in search of a problem. So it may have been impactful for the non-native development world, but, um, uh, but it, in it, it impacted tribes in an unduly discriminatory manner. That is our core legal argument on this. Um, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague Claudio now to talk about these commercial readiness deposits, these security deposit fees, these interconnection queue fees. Claudio, I'm gonna hand it to you. And in doing so, I think I, this is the time I need to tell Brooke to please hand the controls to Claudio. Is that right? Did I do that right? Yes, ma'am, he's yep. got them. Thank you so much. And I've okay. got them, perfect. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks so much, uh, Wendelin. That's a really good overview. Um, so I can just talk a little bit more about uh, what the interconnection queue is and what the commercial readiness deposits uh, are and when they're required, uh, which is, I think, a, a important thing to understand uh, for our petition. Uh, the interconnection queue uh, is the queue of studies to get permitted to connect to the larger grid. Um, and so when you're constructing a utility scale project, this is a necessary part of obtaining a power purchasing agreement of the whole uh, project. Um, it, this is an integral part of that. 
And so the timing with which the commercial readiness deposit is required, specifically the one that we are uh, petitioning FERC that tribes should be exempt from, is right at the beginning. Um, and uh, it's it's important that this is the case, or it's important to understand that this is the case that it happens right at the beginning, because uh, this is before construction, uh, before a shovel hits the ground, um, and that is a really difficult uh, stage at which to raise a, this additional capital, um, which only goes to show really that the tribe is serious about constructing their project. Um, and as Wendelin was saying before, uh, it's unduly discriminatory, discriminatory and an extremely um, heavy administrative burden for tribes to either pay these fees or go out and obtain uh, a lawyer or an attorney to get the waiver. Um, and so our argument is that there are better ways to uh, tell whether a tribe is serious about constructing the project. Um, and these are some alternative uh, indicators that FERC could use to tell uh, whether a tribe is serious um, which we know that they most often are. Uh, and we know that, but we just have to be able to communicate that to FERC and give them uh, a, a guideline uh, for their analysis. Um, and so you can read them below, they're on the screen right now, um, different sorts of uh, governmental uh, documents uh, or and processes that can happen at the tribal level, um, such as a tribal resolution being adopted for the project um, uh, or a, a tribal policy, a clean energy standard or a renewable energy standard. Um, it, you can also, uh, the tribe can also show that they have received other federal grants for the specific project, which we think, uh, we believe should indicate to FERC that uh, the project has a high likelihood of being constructed. Um, and yeah, and if there's any questions, uh, lob them in the chat or save them for the end. Um, but there's a, a portion of the, uh, a portion of the, relationship with FERC that I think Crystal can expand upon um, uh, regarding consultation. I'm going to add a little bit more on the commercial readiness deposits here. Thank you so much for that, Claudia. That was a fantastic overview. These, these, this, this terminology of commercial readiness, um, it's not set in statute anymore, in anywhere. This is something that federal attorneys, um, Department of Energy, Department of Treasury, FERC. This is something that these uh, governmental attorneys, and I say this with all due respect, because um, these are great public servants who really, who really are on the cause of, um, uh, of of committing to clean energy. But these lawyers, their job is to protect the agency. Their job is not to protect the mission. And so these commercial readiness deposit, that these requirements come up from the standpoint of a governmental attorney who's trying to protect the agency from taking too much of a risk, if you will. And we think that this notion of an additional $5 million or $7 million, whatever the case may be, depending on the region, um, this may be appropriate for a non-native development, and but we don't think it's appropriate for Indian country. So we like to put it back on our tribal communities and say, well, what do you all think would be the appropriate, culturally appropriate um, indicators, indicia for commercial readiness? And maybe commercial readiness isn't even the right terminology. Maybe it's more about community uh, readiness, tribal readiness, uh, cultural readiness. Um, what does it mean to be, quote unquote, serious about uh, one's project? And we noticed that this, um, this terminology of commercial readiness, it started to come up in a number of different places, and it was seeming to become problematic around a couple of different agencies. We see it at FERC, obviously, in this case here. We see it at the U.S. Department of Energy in their loan program office, LPO, especially with the tribal loan program that has only um, uh, successfully granted one loan to um, uh, through its program to the Viejas Band. Um, and we also see it over at Treasury it, in the 48 little e bonus credits where category one is the, the tribal category. And so we at the Alliance started to think, well, maybe if we're not seeing good uptake uh, with tribal uh, loan program at DOE, and maybe if we're not seeing the complete uptake 
in the tribal category one of the 48 little e bonus credits, maybe the problem isn't the tribes. Maybe the problem is the, with the federal government. And maybe part of the problem is in this definition of what commercial readiness is. And maybe this isn't the right metric. So we very much encourage tribes in their responses to FERC, and we're happy to walk you through this. We're gonna have a bunch more details here in a second. Come up with your own. We've we've come up with some suggestions here in our consultate in our conversations with tribes, um, but we're sure that there are more. Um, so so please think creatively and think from your own standpoint of what might be an indicator that your tribe is quote unquote serious and ready to go with your um, with your utility scale renewable uh, energy projects. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to. Crystal, who's going to talk a little bit more about the consultation process. Controls now. Awesome. Can you all hear me? Okay. So, for our energy consultation with tribe and tribal leaders, first time ever in history on an electrical matter. Uh, there designated to this petition uh, that uh, says we have this board um, and you can find it. I believe we did submit it with um, the rest of our uh, native center we'll have up on the course. Um, you can Google it. Uh, two set consultation was actually Monday, October 28th. And we will provide in some of the themes and conversations that arose during that uh, consultation. I'd like to discuss slightly about where we are now and how we've come to this place. What are some of the, the things that we saw through this consultation that for established? One of the things that we identified was both pros and cons. The one of the only pros that we early on was that it was the one in the like we but we did see many other uh, cons. One of what is a, it's not a sovereign to sovereign consultation. Hey, Crystal, I'm so sorry. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I'm finding your connection maybe a little choppy. Maybe you want to turn off your video. We love to see your beautiful face. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Uh-oh, I think it's even a little worse now. <clears throat> Are you guys experiencing that as a little worse? Um, yes, okay. Um, Claudio, can I ask you to handle the consultation um, process discussion? Apologies to our audience. Yeah, no worries. Um, uh, no, really apologies because Crystal uh, does a great job explaining um, <laughs> the dynamics here, but sure. Yeah, as Crystal was saying, um, this is the first time FERC has held tribal consultation on an electrical matter. Um, and we at the Alliance view that as a big win, um, you know, regardless of uh, where the petition goes, uh, the fact that FERC is sitting down at the table um, and listening to tribes uh, is a big win um, and should not be overlooked. Um, however, we have throughout this experience come to understand that there are ways in which uh, the consultation uh, could be happening uh, better, to put it to put it bl bluntly. Um, I believe Crystal was saying right before uh, she dropped off that um, there is an issue where FERC is holding a mass consultation, a one to many, as it were, um, where they, as the federal government, are interacting with uh, tribal governments plural, rather than opening up uh, their doors and inviting tribal governments uh, one on one uh, to come in and have that conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, there were other barriers, uh, to the, to the October 28th, uh, uh, consultation that had to do with sign up, um, the, the forms to sign up and who could sign up was not exactly made, uh, crystal clear, um, no pun intended. Um, and, uh, and there was a, a couple issues that we communicated to FERC, um, that could be resolved in the future, um, 
But we believe that it is imperative that tribes, when they do show up, uh, voice these concerns because, you know, it's great if we say that tribal consultation could be better um, at the Alliance, but when it comes from tribes directly saying, um, you know, this is not capital C consultation um, with from from one sovereign to another sovereign, um, that I think will speak a lot, uh, will speak more volumes. Um, yeah, Wendelin, did I did I miss anything? Yeah, that's great. And and but un, but unfortunately, it gets worse. You guys, <laughs> um, the um, the process of signing up for this, it's not just like a you know the way the way the Department of Treasury makes it pretty easy to go to a consultation, a, a video consultation. You sign in ahead of time. They'll send you a login or something. Um, but what we experienced the other day, and I think we're, um, Brooke, we're ready to go to the next slide or whoever's in charge of um, advancing slides. Um, the, uh, the, the process of signing up has been clunky. And then when we had the first of two consultation sessions this last Monday, um, two days ago, uh, they were using a WebEx platform that nobody could figure out. Most people couldn't um dial in uh appear via via video uh we all had to resort to dialing in on the side we ended up getting started 15 minutes late into two hours and then i thought the worst part was that they encouraged they didn't require but they encouraged tribal leaders to restrict their time uh, of their comments to seven minutes and I don't know about you all, but when I'm involved in a, on a formal briefing, I, always, I often have a little chat session going on with some of my colleagues off to the side. I'm sure some of you have done that in your work before. And the joke among us became, is this how they would treat Kate Middleton? Is this how they would treat the King of England? Um, and so it didn't seem to us that FERC really was doing the best it could uh, in consultation. So we really encourage tribes to, um, when they comment on this, to comment not only on the substance of what's in the petition, because that's really important, that's why we're going to all this effort, but also on the consultation process itself. As Claudio mentioned, no, sorry, as Crystal mentioned, um, this is the first time ever that FERC has entertained uh, consultation on an electrical matter where tribes are in the driver's seat, where tribes are agents of a development. All previous consultations that FERC has conducted in the past had to do with a hydroelectric matter or a pipeline um, or uh, a transmission line, what have you, where the tribe was um, in reaction to some other developer being the agent and doing the work. So this is new for FERC to see tribes as um, as agents in the market, uh, as market participants, as the developers. And, you know, we, we, we've we seen this also at, at Interior, at the Bureau of Land Management, at BLM, when they were going through their preliminary uh, environmental impact statement, the, 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 the solar review for um, looking at uh, uh, preliminary impact imp uh, uh, impact statements for BLM on, on uh, solar on BLM lands, where it was kind of a surprise to FERC, to BLM at that time, that tribes would themselves be agents in the market. So we're at a new point, I think, in the tribal federal interface where the federal government is just starting to understand all the implications of tribes being renewable energy developers. And so I really encourage tribes to um, point out to FERC what tribal expectations around consultation with a big C uh, should really look like. Um, we've got um, where we are in the consultation process right now. We had the first video session uh, this last Monday, the second video session will be this next Monday. And um, so please get your registration in by Friday. Um, and the registration can be found in the Dear Tribal Letter, Dear Tribal Leader Letter um, that's on the FERC uh, website for this. We'll throw that in the chat as well. Uh, registration is required. 
Um, some other complicated things about it um, is that initially the FERC language said that either, a, thank you so much for that, Brooke, um, either a tribal leader or their designee could show up. And those of you who are lawyers or, or who can clearly read logic in a sentence, it was very, it was very clear, black and white, either the tribal leader or a designee could show up. And so that we had a lot of shuffling around last week and said, hey, wait a minute, what if, what if the tribal leader wants to be accompanied by their attorney? What if both want to show up? And FERC responded, oh yeah, that's no problem. Well, my goodness, if, if that's no problem, then why didn't you write that? Um, and creating a lot of unnecessary obstacles, I think. Um, that uh, of, of uh, can multiple people show up on, on behalf of a tribe, who can speak, and what's up with this um, suggested limit, uh, this encouraged limit of seven minutes. And um, that just seemed, seemed unnecessary. Now, the way that FERC has posed, um, uh, posed this consultation, they're hovering in on a bunch of uh, questions, six questions, and they got these questions by extracting the arguments from the Alliance's petition. Um, the first one, um, the first several are about TITOs, Tribal Energy Development Organizations. And this is new for FERC to be um, learning what these mean. Uh, and so we encourage you to, um, to comment on, um, on TITOs, on how FERC is regarding TITOs, and maybe even expanding um, how FERC regards working with tribes, Section 17 organizations and such, um, to see whether they need to be very literal around this, uh, this Tito regard. And I don't know about you all, but I find this stuff a little bit, you know, legally is kind of hard to read, not too terribly approachable, um, but it gets right down to a bunch of the points that we've been, um, we've been making earlier uh, in this about um, about how these interconnection queue fees uh, would encourage or discourage tribes from uh, going to the end of the road and going to the end of a project and really falling through and building theirs. The last question is an interesting one, whether energy pro projects developed by tribes are more likely to proceed to commercial operation than those projects that would be proposed by other developers. And I, you know, I kind of wonder about this one, sort of what's the question behind the question? Why are they asking that in that way? And I wonder about this, whether, whether FERC is concerned uh, about a number of things, about whether if by um, reducing these initial security deposit fees for tribes, whether FERC perceives that they're gonna unleash this wild set of activities where, you know, each of the 574 tribes uh, goes and, and puts forth multiple projects and holds multiple queue spots, whether tribes would then go about similar speculative activity. And I keep coming back and the answer to that question, you know, and may, maybe I'm being a little bit too critical of FERC on this by, by wondering what the question behind their question was. Um, but I don't think that's what tribes are going to do. I actually think tribes are in this business to provide for their people, provide essential electrons, address some of the structural inequities that have um, come up over time. Um, I also think that the another piece of the question behind the question on this might have something to do with whether we think um, uh, if, if a tribe does enter the interconnection queue fee, uh, interconnection queue, and for some reason they pull out, why? Are they pulling out because really they were speculating all along? Or maybe they're pulling out because the rest of their, they weren't able to satisfy the rest of their capital stack. Or there was a change in government and the government might want to do something differently. Or maybe they're having other hurdles with their, um, with their financiers. So answering these questions can be kind of down in the weeds, if you will. Um, and so we at the Alliance are, are trying to help kind of translate this into some language that um, might be more, if you will, approachable. Um, and what we see will be helpful in, um, in, uh, in, in tribal responses to FERC. 
Um, and, and first of all, we know that FERC wants to hear from tribes and tribal organizations who have quote unquote felt the pain um, that they've been personally uh, impacted by the imposition of these fees. And here, um, and we've, we've had great debriefs with a number of our advisors in the last several days following the initial consultation. What we've learned is that um, we think that, we think FERC really wants to hear stories we want to, they want to hear the stories. They're going to be impacted by stories. There may down the road, if this results in a new notice of proposed rulemaking, which we're, we're, we're hopeful for, um, there may be opponents to this. And those opponents may come from states or municipalities or other ethnic groups who wonder why it is that um, tribes are differently situated and deserve special treatment here. It may come from the developers um, themselves who are concerned about um, queue clogging, if you will. But there's one thing that n any of those, all of those other potential opponents, and we don't know if it's real, it's just a potential right now, um, that they don't have. And they don't have the stories. The tribes have the stories. So tell your story. Tell your stories about the general challenges with utility scale renewable energy development. Tell the stories about overarching financial challenges and the um, structural exclusion from the large-scale capital markets, the absence of the market itself on reservation. If you happen to be um, an energy attorney living and working inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C., and you never spend any time on a reservation, you might not be aware of the absence of the market on a reservation, the fact that you have to go off res to find um, great food or um, you might have to go off res to find a bank or other financial services or to get your car fixed or what have you. Um, so uh, it is the case that many federal attorneys don't understand the reality of living in Indian country. And I realize as a, a non-native, here I am telling you all this. Um, uh, so, so tell the stories. And especially tell the stories of the poor and inequitable electrical service. The, the, the bad resiliency of electricity on many, in many tribal nations. Tell the stories of the transmission power lines overhead, but on electrified homes that don't have water pumps. Um, tell those stories. Um, please, uh, please tell those stories. And we think it's the stories that will, in the end, um, be the most effective. And that's that's our run through this presentation. I, I'm going to ask Crystal and Claudio just to, to say, what did I miss you guys? And um, what other additional points uh, should we be making here? And we're, we're also happy for everyone else to come off mute and, and go live and answer any questions here. Um, no, Wendelin, that was great. Uh, I'll just... My... No, no, go ahead, Crystal. I was just going to see if you can me and, and then I'll provide a, a little uh, extra really quickly. Um, yeah, no, I was just going to say that um, if, if anybody uh, on this call or who watches this call later um, wants to reach out to us to schedule a briefing. Yeah, Wendelin, exactly. Um, we can we can do that uh, and we can give you more in depth um, into the, the process and uh, what FERC wants to hear about. So, yeah, just please reach out. Yes, and I was just going to add slightly to what Wendelin had said. She she wrapped it up very clearly and, and concisely as she says. Uh, but one of the things that we've heard, heard as a team throughout the conversations that we had is not only is FERC looking to hear all from all of you and the stories that you, that are impacted your community, your nation, and your citizens, but also how you've been discouraged from entering into. Other, other tribal leaders who have endeavored the same. I was in a briefing uh, several months ago, perhaps this spring, well before we filed the petition. We filed the petition August 9th. We were preparing for it and we had great meetings with FERC staff. We found them very open. Um, we've been working with FERC for um, a, exactly two years now. Um, that we've been working very closely with them, helping them roll out the tribal portion of their equity action plan. 
Um, and so we've gotten to know these staff members and, and we know very well that a lot of them have been going through cultural training and understand to tribal to try and understand tribal policy, trust responsibility. And so we know that they were speaking from the heart when they said to us, well, what do you mean that tribes have been structurally excluded from the large scale capital markets? We don't understand. I know they weren't being snide and I know they're not stupid. These people are really, really smart energy lawyers who are really good at their jobs and they're dedicated to their mission, but they don't have training in Indian law and they don't have training in uh, yet um, in, uh, in, in tribal policies and in trust responsibilities. So if there are ways that you can share your experience of the inequities, please share those. Even if it's, you know, maybe a little off topic, they need to hear the stories. Um, so this is the time to um, share broadly and, and share widely uh, in all of that. And um, I am now just going to start speaking slowly and see if anyone has any questions and feel free, feel free to throw them in the public chat here um, and or feel free to come off mute either way. We are also more than happy to do one on one briefings. We've been doing a lot of these because you guys like as if renewable energy project finance wasn't hard enough. Now we throw on top of it. FERC rules. I've been in the clean energy business for 20 years and uh, I learn new FERC stuff every day. So this stuff is um, it's very complicated uh, and almost on purpose and the whole FERC's whole idea of having their Office of Public Participation, their OPP, uh, is to demystify uh, the commission itself. They knew they needed some help with demystifying themselves, so they have this wonderful Office of Public Participation. And we know that the folks in OPP are really fighting from the inside uh, to try and make consultation work better. So we'll be helping them if when we tell FERC, hey, the way you all are um, uh, the way you all are approaching consultation is insufficient. Um, Brooke, I'm about to hand it back to you unless we hear anyone who has questions. I don't know if folks raise their hands or if they just speak up. We're happy for any of you to do any of that. Yeah, if y'all joined with your mic enabled, you can unmute. Or if you joined with your mic disabled, because I know that is typically our preference, um, if you just click out of the webinar, you can click on that um, red menu panel <laughs> that I had told you not to click on during the intro. But if you click on that, it'll pull you out. OK, we ha see have a question here from Mr. Red Cloud. Thank you so much for that, James. Um, are there talking points you've developed to help those of us on the nonprofit side of things with meaningful dialogue on the electrical co-op in our rural community? Yes, we have talking points. We have talking points. We have one pagers. We have PowerPoints. We have templates. <laughs> and guess who produced all of those, you guys? Crystal and Claudio. I have an amazing team. I feel so lucky. Oh, look, it's all coming out. Oh, and we have we have the one pager that looks very beautiful now. Um, Mr. Red Cloud, if you want to reach out to us um, and and our, our email protocol is, is um, not too difficult. It's just first name at tribalcleanenergy.org, but the, 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 the alias of policy at tribalcleanenergy.org reaches all of us. Send us a note, please, and we're happy to email you all of those items. We have talking points, we have one pagers, we have um, templates, we have, we have all of these things. Happy to, happy to help out. Um, and the deadline for this, you all, the deadline for this is November 18th at 5 p.m. Eastern. So I suspect that after the uh, video consultation um, on Monday, November 4th, nothing else going on in the country that week, folks, right? All attention is going to be on, on this FERC petition. Jeez Louise, a little frustrated that they <clears throat> put it then, but, but who knows, maybe it'll be a uh, Maybe it'll be some relief for folks for, from watching television and watching about the campaign and the election. Um, but regardless, um, I suspect that in the days in between Monday, November 4th, and then the 18th, when final, final written comments are due, I suspect we'll be having a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, discussions with tribes, um, tribal organizations, and um, talking about particular issues. I know some of our friends from among the tribes in uh, in Oklahoma 
um, have been um, kind of uh, pulling together and, and having conversations among themselves about uh, about how they might align to uh, to address this. Um, and but again, you know, the most the most effective comments are going to be the ones that tell stories as opposed to just oh just saying oh yeah we support the petition. That that's better than nothing. Please know, you know, a, a letter saying yes we support the petition. That's better than nothing. But way more impactful is telling the story, telling the story, even if even if your tribe or your tribal organization hasn't already begun construction or hasn't really started to pull it together, just the mere um, the mere prospect of of looking at this and gosh, how are you going to accomplish all of this? Because renewable energy development, like it's hard, folks. Um, I've been in this business 20 years. I was there at the beginning of the learning curve when we were all trying to learn this together. And I kind of feel like that's where we are for Indian country right now is just at the beginning of the learning curve. Uh, so, um, so don't be shy. And we are um, happy to answer any further questions. I'm going to be quiet now to see if anyone else wants to go off mute. Hey, y'all, if you had joined without mic capability and you're worried that maybe if you exit the webinar to rejoin with your mic turned on and people will already be gone, um, feel free to let us know in the chat if, you know, you have a question and you just need to rejoin with your mic turned on um, or you could take down their emails and ask the question that way. You could ask the question in the chat. We have a few different options. Just let us know. All right, um, I'm going to keep an eye out if anybody starts typing, but I am also going to just go through um, the outro. Um, so thank you so much, everybody who joined us today. Um, I have already put the link to the webinar feedback survey into the chat. If you don't mind taking a minute or two to complete that for us, helps us know what's working well, what we can improve upon for the future. And we do provide our instructors with feedback reports as well. Um, we hope you can catch tomorrow's webinar on October 31st. This is going to be on communication plans. Um, our instructor is Amy Wilson, who's the founder and principal consultant of C Renewal LLC. Um, remember, on this new platform, you don't have to individually uh, register for webinars. You just join the platform once, and then after that, you will have access to all of them. You'll just join the website at the time of the webinar itself, and you will see that green banner. Um, our times haven't changed, so 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central. 12 p.m. Mountain, 11 a.m. Pacific, and 10 a.m. Alaska. Um, our webinars archive has moved to our YouTube channel. Um, that link is here on the slide, and it is also provided for you in the shared notes, and I will put it in the chat one more time. Um, feel free to watch any of our recorded webinars. They go back about the last two years. Um, and the recording of this webinar will also be posted for you um, once that recording generates. So give me until probably tomorrow to have it up on YouTube. Um, we hope you can check out our upcoming events. We are on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. We have our in-house produced podcast, the Hope Hopethenga Native American podcast. You can catch that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Simplecast, Google Podcasts. And if you prefer to uh, watch us interview our guests, we do record the interviews, and those can also be found on our YouTube channel. All right, folks, um, it doesn't look like anybody is typing or unmuting with questions. Um, Crystal did provide all of their emails in the chat for you. So if you do have follow up questions, feel free to reach out to them. You can also reach out to us here at the Native Learning Center. I'll put my email into the chat as well. Um, but with that, I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of their day. If you are somebody who celebrates Halloween, then I wish you an early happy Halloween. Please be safe. Um, and everybody have a fantastic rest of your day. I'm going to go ahead and close us out. Uh, this recording will be posted into the course um, on our online platform. And again, it will also be um, in our Cathedra archive on YouTube.
Oh, we do have somebody type in. Let me hang back. Oh, multiple users. How exciting. All right. Oh, yeah, it is our pleasure. Thank you, John. All right, y'all. Everybody have a great rest of your day. I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Thank you so much to Wendelin and Crystal and Claudio. We really appreciate you come on here, coming on here and talking about the petition. It is so important. And I will get this recording posted as soon as possible. All right, y'all. Take care. Bye.